and the CCDS exam coordinator for ACTUS. I will be the moderator for today's program. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. The first portion of the program is presented to follow, I'm sorry, is presentation and will be followed by a question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and you will be able to view it again via the on-demand version. A link will be posted to the CCDS certification page on the ACTUS website. We'll share that address for the web page at the end of the program. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review the web conference platform. First, to ensure that you can see all of the content for the event, please maximize your event window. Second, please adjust your computer volume settings and make sure that your PC speakers are set at the correct volume. If you experience any trouble listening to the audio using your computer speakers, you may select Use Telephone to dial in and listen via the phone instead. Third, to submit a question, go to the Questions window located on the bottom right side of your screen. Type your question into the box at the bottom and then click the Send button. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is more likely that your question may not be answered until we get to the Q&A portion of the program. If you experience any technical difficulties during the web portion of today's program and need assistance, please contact our customer service department at 800-575-6787. Now I'd like to introduce today's other speakers. Our first speaker is Cheryl Erickson, MS, RN, CCDS, CDIP, a HEMA approved ICD-10 CM PCS trainer and the clinical documentation program for e EZDI. She is the former CDI education director for HC Pro and she serves on the ACTUS advisory board and the CCDS exam committee. Welcome Cheryl. Thanks Penny, I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Next is Fran Jurak, MSN, RN, CCDS, and the Senior Director with Huron Consulting Group based in Chicago. She is the author of the CCDS Exam Study Guide and she serves on the CCDS Exam Committee and is a former member of the ACTUS Advisory Board. Welcome, Fran. Thanks for having me, Penny. Now, before we get started, please take a look at the right side of your event window and you'll find a Handouts tab where you can find a copy of this slide presentation that we're about to go through. Please feel free to print it out for your reference if you don't already have a copy. And with that, let's begin the presentation. As we get started, I'd like to invite you to just sit back and listen. You don't need to worry about taking a lot of notes. We will post this recording onto the ACTUS website in the next few days, along with a copy of the slide presentation. That will have all of the links and all the titles that will be referenced during this conference. To get going on the CCDS exam, you need to download and read the exam candidates handbook that's available on the ACTUS website on the certification page under the How to Apply tab. It answers all the questions that you might think to ask. Now remember, you'll get all these links when we download the program later on. Every CCDS exam candidate must be able to demonstrate a minimum of two years of experience as a concurrent documentation specialist. This means working in an inpatient setting, in a short-term acute care US-based facility. We define concurrent documentation review as working in medical records in the current time, when the patient is present and in-house as a patient and in collaboration with physicians and medical team members who are caring for the patient. Cheryl, do you have anything you might want to add to that? Yeah, um, a lot of people have asked, what about if I work in the outpatient setting, or what if I'm a foreign physician, or along those lines? And there's a lot of different people who feel like they may be qualified for the CCDS, but this is the starting point. Um, in the future, they may be other exams that are specific to the outpatient area or so forth. But the important thing here is that you're doing concurrent review um, in the CDI scope of work, because there are a lot of professions that are similar to the CDI profession, but not the same. So that's why we have those limitations there. 
And Penny, Thank this you, is, Carol. If, if I could just add that the Absolutely. goal in any certification is really to um, recognize those people who are proficient in a role and recognize them for the great work that they've been doing, not serve as an entry level uh, requirement or a test to pass so that you can get a, a, a position. This is really to recognize those people who are truly experts in the, in the role and in the profession. Good point, Fran. Thank you. And thank you, Cheryl. The education requirements are that people hold an RN, an MD, uh, DO, RHIA, RHIT. You can see the list that is here plus the two years of experience working as a concurrent documentation specialist. That's really the key. Someone who has an associate's degree in an allied health program needs to have three years of experience as a CDS. Your formal education has to be from an accredited college level program, the coursework in human anatomy and physiology, medical terminology, and two or three years of experience as a CDS, as we've talked. Now, what doesn't qualify as experience? This is probably just as important as what does qualify. Documenting in one's own medical practice um, as a licensed US medical practitioner, foreign medical graduate, et cetera. Documentation that you might have done as a resident, an intern, or a medical student. If you're doing retrospective review, if you're an auditor, if you're an educator, if you're an outpatient coder. Foreign medical graduates that do not have the required two years of CDS experience are not qualified to sit for this exam. In their native countries, foreign trained physicians don't generally work with or have an understanding of the US reimbursement methodology under Medicare, severity measurement and outcomes, and measurement aspects that embody the CDS role. Also, if you hold the CDIP credential from AHIMA, that does not automatically make you qualified to sit for the CCDS exam. And Fran touched on a lot of this in her, in her comment just a moment ago. Fran, anything else? Yeah, I think it really is, and I don't want to be repeating myself, but it really is about recognition as opposed to job entry testing. Thank you. Now, if you feel that you are qualified, again, you're going to download that handbook off the Actus website and read it very carefully. But once you feel that you're qualified, go right ahead and submit your exam application to us. Please use black ink and please write legibly. There's a joke about the fact that nobody can read a doctor's handwriting. Please make sure that we can read it. If we can't read it, we can't process it. You may pay by check or we'll be happy to call you for your credit card payment and your exam must be paid for in advance before you can schedule it. Now what's going to happen when we get your application? It's going to be reviewed in-house here to make sure that you do meet those qualifications. If there's a question, we will contact you. We audit about 25% of our applications, so we may get a hold of your supervisor or manager, person that you will list on that application to verify that you do have the required experience. We will send your name to the exam company once your payment clears through our finance department. And at that point, you'll have 120 days, four months to schedule and take your exam. You are going to schedule your own exam. We don't do that for you. The exam company gives tests Monday through Saturday, with the exception of major holidays at about 200 locations around the country. So you're going to pick the one that you want to go to on the date and at the time you want to take it. You may reschedule your exam one time without in, um, incurring a financial penalty. And when you read and understand the rescheduling requirements, you'll know what to do. The exam company asks that you give two days notice. I find it better to tell people to give it three days notice. Now, we're going to get into how you should prepare for your exam. The only approved resource that we have at this time is the CCDS exam study guide, which our co-speaker Fran has written. The current edition is copyrighted 2012, but it is still a valid book. It is being rewritten with an eye to the new ICD-10 exam, which will go into effect in mid-January. 
There have been some changes made to the exam over the last two or three years, but those are very minor and they do not impact the, um, your ability to use that 2012 edition to successfully prepare and pass this exam. Our CDI boot camps are not designed, nor are they promoted to be CCS exam prep classes. They're wonderful for your foundation as a CDI professional, but you cannot rely on those alone to prepare you for the test. And Penny, if I could just interject here for a minute about the boot camps. Um, a lot of times when people... A lot of times when people are taking the boot camps, it's in the beginning of their career or when they need some formal training. So we just want to make sure people clearly understand that just because you've attended a boot camp doesn't mean that you are now qualified in order to take the exam. However, a lot of the concepts that are on the exam are going to be covered in the boot camp classes itself. So if you've taken a boot camp in the past, you might want to review your materials as you prepare for the CCDS exam. So again, it's that you're not qualified to take the exam just because you've attended a boot camp. Good point. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really important is that you have that minimum of two years of experience. You have to have that anyway to qualify. But the more experience that you have working as a CDS, the better your chances will be when you go to take this exam. So we encourage that additional experience. There are other books that HC Pro publishes that will help you develop a strong CDI foundation. They include the Clinical Documentation Improvement Specialist Complete Training Guide, the CDI Essential Skills Online Learning Library, the CDI Pocket Guide, as well as the boot camps. And again, you don't have to worry about writing all these things down now. You will see a copy of this uh, later on when you download the slides. You can train using any of these items to help you with your foundation. And there, you can network with your peers, reach out to other people who may be studying. See if there's someone in your hospital that's studying. Uh, check with hospitals in the area. You may find other people interested and you can form a study group. Search the ACTUS website. If you're a member, you can get into the CDI Talk archives and you'll find very active chats that have gone on there between folks in the past who were taking the exam. The other thing you might want to think about doing is joining an ACTUS local chapter. When you go onto the ACTUS website, you'll find a tab for local chapters and you can go to the state-by-state -state map to find a list of chapters in your area. Many of them meet by teleconference, so don't overlook one of these as an option if the only chapter happens to be on the other side of the state from where you are. Local chapters offer great networking opportunities. Are there other test prep resources? At this time, there are not. HC Pro and Actus are exploring best options to provide additional cost-saving exam prep resources such as additional test questions, an online learning opportunity, or perhaps even an on-site exam prep class. But none of this is set in stone yet, and we'll have more information for you probably in the spring on that. So before you apply for the exam, make sure you download that CCDS exam candidate handbook. It will give you all the information really that you need in order to prep and take the class. It will identify for you what is required for admission, what resources you can take into the room with you. You are allowed to take in a DRG expert, and there are five different nursing drug guides that you can use, but only one of those five, so make sure you check that list to see which ones are accepted. Now, when you pass your exam, and notice what I just said there, I said when you pass your exam, because we know you're going to be very successful. Your exam will be scored immediately and you will leave with your results, so you'll know right away what happened. You'll get, an email, or you'll get a mail from us with a certificate and a lapel pin by the, month, by the middle of the month following the month in which you take your exam. You'll be required to recertify every two years on the anniversary of the day that you pass the exam. You're going to do that by going onto our website recertification section, downloading the application there, and submitting to us proof that you earned a minimum of 30 CEUs re related to CDI during the two years that you held the certification. 
And it's very important for you to be aware that it's your responsibility to know your recertification due date. We cannot be held responsible if we can't get a hold of you by email or regular mail to give you a reminder. Now for those folks who don't pass the exam on the first attempt, they need to wait 90 days before they can take the exam again. We offer a one-time discounted re-exam fee of $125, and should that person need to take subsequent exam attempts, those would be at the full price. The re-exam application is also available on the ACCESS website. So what's next for CCDS? Next will be a new version of the exam. It will be effective in mid-January of 2016. It will incorporate both ICD-10 and CDI quality initiatives. We're waiting to start giving an ICD-10 exam until ICD-10 has been in effect for a few months. That takes place on October 1st. So with a few months of I-10 under, under your belt, you'll be ready to take the test in mid-January. A lot of people have asked us when the exam is changing because they know about that 90-day window between attempts. And what we're telling folks is that if you're ready to take the exam now and you want to go ahead and apply, if you take it by the middle of September, your 90 days, the 90-day wait would hit about the middle of December for you to be able to take it again and you'd be doing it again under I-9, the system that you're currently using. So if you're ready now, you may want to think about getting your application into us. Cheryl, did you want to add anything about the uh, ICD-10 version? I did. And the, the one thing I know a lot of people are, are very concerned about, what will things look like once we go to ICD-10? Um, how, how much difference is there going to be in the exam? And I want to remind people that the role of CDI is really documentation clarification. Yes, you need to understand coding guidelines, you need to understand coding clinic and so forth, but the bulk of the work that we do as CDIs is focused more on documentation or the words rather than the code itself. So a lot of the terminology is very consistent between ICD-9 and ICD-10 when it comes to diagnoses. Um, so it's not really going to be a disadvantage if you aren't prepared or aren't qualified to take the test until it goes to ICD-10 because the majority of the concepts are going to be very similar across ICD-9 and ICD-10. It's just that the codes are going to look different and because this is a CDI exam, it's based more on the documentation itself rather than identifying and recognizing codes in the ICD-10 code set. Also, um, the quality initiatives, we did a survey, our HC Pro did a survey recently, and they asked for input from current CCDS exam holders. And they were asking them, what do you do in your day-to-day -day job? So they basically did a job analysis. And through that, we were able to identify how the role of CDI has evolved. And we're seeing that a majority of CDIs are involved in quality initiatives, and that's why that's going to be a component on the exam as well. But the guidelines regarding how you prepare for the exam, all the links that um, Penny has given you to, uh, will be giving you as a part of this presentation, you'll see what are those core content areas within the exam, and it'll explain how quality initiatives will be addressed. That's great, Cheryl. Thank you. Welcome. Well, that concludes the presentation portion of the program, um, and now we can get into the Q&A section. Uh, before we start that, Fran, did you have anything that you might want to add in? No, I think one of the, the key things, and I'm sure we'll have probably at least one question related to this, is you know, the preparation of the day or the day of the test and what to do and, and some of that specificity. I'm a former nursing professor, and so I've had a lot of experience with helping people prepare for how to take a test, particularly an electronic test. And I will say there are some key things that are identified in the candidate handbook that speak specifically to getting a good night's sleep. You know, some of the obvious things related to how do I best put, put my foot forward to do, uh, to pass the test successfully. So making sure that you have the resources that you've prepared yourself are, are certainly key pieces. But I think also just mentally having that right attitude, getting that good night's sleep, having a good breakfast, and being prepared for the fact that you're going to sit there for a couple hours and work through uh, an exam with a lot of questions. So trial uh, questions uh, are a great way to practice uh, doing some extra review maybe some cases uh, from your coworkers that were difficult or challenging, 
uh, getting involved in conversation related to metrics or quality or some of the other components that are included in, in the exam itself all become opportunities to um, feel more confident and comfortable going into the exam. So I think preparation is knowledge, but it's also preparing yourself mentally. That's a great point, Fran. Thank you. All right, as we get ready to start with Q&As, let me remind you to submit a question. Go to the question window located on the right side of your screen. Type your question in the box at the bottom and then click the Send button. Please note that your questions may remain will remain anonymous and will not be viewed by any other audience members. And with that, we've got some great ones here that we're going to start with. We've had somebody ask, if I can't take the CCDS for exam for another year and have already purchased the current study book, would I be better to purchase the new book with ICD-10? And I'm going to start that one off by saying absolutely yes, you should plan to get the new book because effective January, middle of January, we will be giving an ICD-10 based exam. Now Fran, let me ask you, does the current ICD-9 version of the book do this candidate any good? Are there other materials within it that maybe they, they would want to study up on? Or will all of that kind of information go into the next edition? Yeah, I, I think, Penny, the majority of the information that's necessary, um, you know, the content of the book is driven by the content of the exam and the outline that's in the handbook. So all of that information would be carried forward where appropriate into the new handbook. So when we talk about metrics and you know how a DRG is even established, all of those basics related to CDI and the IPPS system translate into the new book as well as the bringing in of the quality and the, the components that come from ICD-10. Now that being said, since the new book is not yet out, if you're looking to continue to grow in knowledge base, the content that's in the current is definitely applicable and will be useful in the future. But I would uh, second your suggestion to go ahead and get the new one, if, just to make sure that you've got all content covered. OK, good. Thank you. Another question. Is the DRG Expert 2013 edition recent enough to use for the exam, or do I need to pur purchase the newest version? People taking the current exam should be using an ICD-9 based DRG expert book. My understanding is that the 12, the 13, and the 14 editions are all ICD-9 based, and that the 2015 edition is more ICD-10 based. So my response to that would be yes, a 2013 DRG expert is fine to use for the current exam. Cheryl, you want to add anything to that? Um, just that there's only been minimal changes. We've been in a coding freeze since 2011, and there's been a little bit of changes in the DRGs, but those DRGs are not ones that are commonly reviewed by CDIs. So I think the bulk of the information that you would need would be consistent with a 2013 DRG expert. Uh, Great. Penny, if I may? Sure. I think the other thing to point out here is that the exam itself does not highlight or contain very many numbers. In other words, we're not looking for code numbers. We're not looking for DRG numbers. Uh, Cheryl said it earlier where this is really about documentation. It's not about the codes. And that, that holds true across the board. So although the DRG expert is a great reference um, for the words that speak to why we're doing what we're doing that help drive an appropriate code, the exam itself is not centered around a number. It's centered around the concepts related to how you uh, query, how you apply those numbers, what documentation you would need to be able to get to those numbers, but there are no content, there are no code numbers or DRG numbers that you need to reference. So it's probably less important to think about the DRG numbers and code numbers than it is to think about the words that are necessary to drive the change in the documentation or the accuracy in the documentation. Okay, good. Thank you, friend. I have somebody asking, what is the pass rate for the first time test taker? The pass rate is about 75 to 76 percent, and the passing grade on the exam is a 76. 
Here's an interesting question that I've never seen anybody ask before, so I'll have to have Fran and Cheryl help me with it. Have you found that CDI at pediatric-only institutions is any disadvantage when taking the CCDS exam? Ladies, either one of actually, you? Actually, we had someone ask this question when we did this presentation uh, live in, uh, at the conference this year. And um, oh, well, the, thank you for remembering. Yeah. <laughs> The concepts uh, related to documentation, why we do this, why we need this accuracy, all of that, and how you monitor metrics within the program all remain the same. The differences become in how medical conditions are defined or described in the pediatric, neonatal world, et cetera. So uh, from that perspective, I, and I know we had some conversation as to, you know, uh, long term, would we expect there to ever be a separate certification for a pediatric C CC or CDI, um, and I don't know that it's really necessary. I think we th there are some components in terms of how you frame a query and what co clinical indicators are included in that query that might be different. But the concepts of why documentation is important, the concepts of how you run a program, they all remain the same. Whether you're in a an acute care adult facility and a long-term care facility or in a pediatric facility, Cheryl, would you agree with that? I would agree with that, and I would just like to add that the other consideration is do keep in mind that this exam is based on MSDRG methodology, so the IPPS. The reason why I'm emphasizing that is a lot of state Medicaids are using APRDRG methodology, and so that fits better with the pediatric population. So I do know of some candidates who are from Maryland because APRDRG is the Medicare payment methodology for their Medicare population, um, as, as well as some of the pediatric hospitals are using APRDRG methodology. There is a little bit different approach in how you review a record under APR under MSDRG. The good news is, though, is that if you understand the complexity of APRDRG, then the MSDRG methodology is, is almost um, kind of like a beginner methodology, if you will, to APRDRG. And what I mean by that is you can memorize what's a CC and what's an MCC. APRDRG takes a little bit more finesse. It's a little more of an art, if you will, because every diagnosis has a potential impact on that DRG compared to the MSDRG where it's only an, a diagnosis identified as a CC complicating condition or MCC major complicating condition. So if you're very strong in understanding the methodology related to pediatrics, um, even if it's APRDRG, that should still translate into MSDRG because you're probably familiar from articles and so forth what are the big pain points within MSDRG. You know, almost everybody's familiar with CHF even though that may not be a pediatric condition. And um, you know, there's a lot of common knowledge in the industry about different disease processes. So yeah, there's going to be a few curveballs on the exam because there's always a few curveballs to make sure that you're really on your toes. But as long as you have a good general grasp of the concepts related to um, reimbursement methodology, the MDCs, the you know, different body systems and things like that, you should, should still be able to um, be successful on the exam. Great, ladies, thank you. <clears throat> the next question. I haven't started studying for the test yet. How much time do you think it will take to effectively prepare for the exam? Fran? So as, as a former nursing professor who had to deal with nursing students who would ask the same question when it came to taking their license exam, the reality is the reason there's a, a, a time frame where we want you to have worked in the role is this really isn't about studying for a test. It's really about being able to apply your experience and knowledge from what you've been doing and demonstrate that through passing or taking some questions that allow you to pass and get a certificate. So the, the, the real question here isn't, you know, how do I, how do I, how much time do I need to study? It's really about how comfortable are you in your role? How confident are you? How invested are you in the um, other work related to CDI that's outside of an immediate medical record that you're looking at, looking at how your program is run, uh, looking at how you communicate with some of the other departments related to documentation issues, and just having a general good sense 
of what all of this means to the reimbursement system as well as in the future the quality uh, scores. So uh, it, you know, it, it's not something you can study for overnight. It's also not something that you can cram for the day before you're scheduled to take the test. It's really about what you've been doing up to this point that leads you to believe you should be recognized as a leader in the business or a, a professional within the role. Um, that said, um, again, I don't think you can look at the study guide or any other practice questions the week of. I think it takes um, some thought process and planning in terms of you know spending a couple weeks um, in advance just to to be comfortable with how the questions are written and kind of getting back into the frame of reference of multiple choice questions, which I know many of us haven't done in years. Uh, if you've been in the in your role for you know multiple years, or you were a nurse before you came to to the CDS role, so it's just getting comfort comfortable with test questions. Not so much how much do I need to study and how much content can I cram into my brain before I go sit and take the exam. It's really stuff you already know, um, and should just be able to take your knowledge and apply it to a question. That's great, Fran. And that leads into a question that someone else asked. If I didn't buy it yet, do you think I have enough time to use the study guide and prepare between now and mid-September? I've been a CDI for three years. I think we can take what Fran said to the previous question. If, if the person with three years of experience is comfortable in the role um, and has the opportunity to pick up that study guide and spend a little time with it, then hopefully she would have success with the exam. Yeah, I would agree with that, Penny. And you know, as as the author of this, my, my intent all along was not to teach people through the book, right? It's really about um, looking for the areas that maybe you don't see daily in your role and making sure that you understand those concepts. But it shouldn't be new information. It should be information that you're already seeing daily in your work and just kind of reinforcing the areas that are bigger opportunity, more common, um, maybe where people sometimes get confused, but it really shouldn't be let me buy this book, read it, learn it, and then take a test. It's really about taking your knowledge base and applying it and then just having some reference and some reminders about what's key and what's important. Right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. The exam has 125, 20, 120 questions on it. They are all multiple choice. The cost to take the exam is $255 for people who are ACTUS members. If you're not an ACTUS member, the cost is $355. And I have someone asking, what basic areas do you need to study? How is the test broken down? The test covers seven different focus areas. I don't have that list in front of me. It is on the ACTUS website. It is in the exam candidates handbook that we recommended that you download. And I would bet any amount of money Fran wants me to that it's all in her in the book as well. Um, I know that there's anatomy and physiology, there's documentation, um, seven different areas. And you can go to the website to see what those are. Unless you yeah. want to rattle them off, Fran, or Cheryl. I think on, um, based on the content areas where CDIs with a nursing background sometimes struggle is application and knowledge of coding guidelines. So if you've never done it, you really should read the coding guidelines. It's not that big of a read. It's really helpful to help understand why things are done a certain way or why specific documentation is needed. But that is one of the core content areas. Um, another one I can think of off the top of my head is MDCs. There's some on metrics. Um, there's some on, on querying and or physician communication. You want to make sure that you've read the industry guidance. And what is industry guidance? Well, AHIMA as a cooperating party has a lot of practice briefs. And the last one done in 2013 was in cooperation with ACTUS. And it's the 2013 query practice brief. I can't remember the exact title of it. But that's good information to be reading, making sure you're familiar with current industry practices. Yeah, and to support that, Cheryl, uh, another key area that I think uh, the uh, everyday CDS often uh, has some difficulty with is that metrics component. So working within your facility and maybe even having conversation with your CDI leadership 
to walk through what metrics are being monitored, what you're doing, how you're using those metrics for performance improvement or process improvement become component, important components for this um, exam as well. Thank you. I have someone asking if my eligibility of four months expires before I schedule an exam, am I eligible for an extension? We encourage people to apply for the exam when they are ready to take it or when they feel they will be ready to take it within that four month time frame. Um, if you feel as though you may not be ready, then I would encourage you to delay making your application. We do um, provide extensions for people who have extenuating circumstances. And those are all on a case-by-case -case basis. Someone is asking, when you sit down to take the test, is there a specific way to fix an answer and go back to a specific question? Yes, yeah, you can go back through, um, through the exam. It's a computerized exam. You can go back and change your answers as you need to. Someone is asking, is a year of employment of core measures, does that count for a year of CDI employment? I don't know how to answer that one. Um, I can take that, and I'm sure Fran will have a perspective to share, to share as well. The, the big difference right. between the quality measures or core measures and um, what the CDI role does is that a lot of times the quality measures is based on data abstraction. So the coding's already been done, and then there's a data dictionary where you're looking for documentation to match up with the requirements within the data dictionary. So although you're in the record, you're reviewing the record, you're looking for particular documentation, that documentation is not necessarily tied to code assignment. So the main strategy or the main um, mission, if you will, of CDI is helping to bridge that translation gap between clinical documentation, that clinical scenario, and what can be captured by a particular code set. So that's why we were talking about how it's, it's kind of, yes, we're going to ICD-10, that's a little scary, but the fact that you need to have particular documentation to be matched to a code set, it's more emphasizing what is that documentation. So um, in understanding that, it's helpful to know that just because you're in the medical record, just because you have two years of case management, just because you have two years of UR, it's a different focus in what you're doing and you're not necessarily looking so that the documentation is accurately captured within the code set. And that's kind of the, the nuance that's, that's different between what a CDI does. Fran, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I would agree with that, Cheryl. And I, and I think when you look at the the criteria, we were just speaking to the seven topic areas um, that are included and in, incorporated in this exam. I think the things that would make it difficult for someone who's only had core measure experience would be that complete understanding of the IPPS or prospective payment system as well as the metrics that are associated with monitoring and evaluating a CDI program. So um, it really doesn't lend itself in the same way because as Cheryl indicated, the focus is so completely different and this is where I think sometimes we get into um, a, a misunderstanding with what does CDI mean or what does documentation mean in a medical record because it obviously could have so many different meanings. We are particularly focused to this component as Cheryl described it and I think it would be difficult for someone without the right background to be successful on the exam. Thank you ladies. Uh, we have a question from someone who is asking about their particular background. They are a foreign medical graduate and have been working in the United States for a short time. Can I apply? Um, I invite that person to be in touch with me via email and we can take that one offline. Here's a great question. Um, since I haven't been using a DRG review book, do I still need to bring it to the exam? and I'm going to let Cheryl and Fran talk about this one. Um, I know that the idea behind bringing in the DRG book is to demonstrate, if you will, or, or you need to be able to use that book in order to take this exam. And I know that a lot of folks use software, encoders, 3M programs, et cetera, that mean that they don't have to physically know how to pick up one of those books and use it but you don't have those opportunities in this exam and you need to know how to use these references. Fran and Cheryl, I invite you to step in on that one. 
Cheryl, you had a great reply to this uh, when we did the live presentation, if you want to, if you remember and can repeat it. Oh, wow. I don't know that I can't necessarily <laughs> remember or repeat Well, it. but I mean, um, I, I think it goes along the line of if, in order to understand the prospective payment system and how, how these codes apply to a DRG, um, if you aren't using the book to do that, it's going to be very difficult to utilize the book as a reference. Yeah. Yeah. And, you're not and using it, it every day. Yeah. Right, and and so um, a lot of people are, I, I like to say, encoder dependent. Um, believe me, I was there too. I used to learn to code on an encoder, and sometimes we hear people saying, I wish I could have brought a code book in rather than a DRG book. Um, really the main thing that you're going to be looking, in the, and Fran's been discussing this already, is how do you apply your knowledge of a DRG? So if you have a choice amongst different DRGs, which one would be the most accurate in this particular situation? That's often the type of application questions that you would see. So if you feel very comfortable that you're able to accurately identify um, DRGs and understand which is an appropriate one based on a particular situation, you may not need the DRG expert. Um, I'll personally share that, yes, I took my DRG expert. Yes, I took my drug book. Did I open them? No. So um, it just depends. Uh, sometimes it's a comfort thing of just knowing that you've got that there. And so if you don't want to invest in it, you could probably borrow somebody's book to take with you. Um, but then some people have their DRG expert that they put notes in. And Penny, this might be a good opportunity for you to share um, about notes in your DRG expert um, and whether or not those are allowed and how they're allowed. Right. You are allowed to make or bring in a book with you into which you have made notes. Those would be the kinds of notes that you would use in the day-to-day -day using of that book to do your job. So uh, any notes that you have in the margins, any tabs that you have that, that allow you to move through that book quickly to get to the spot that you need to work in, those are all allowed. What you can't do is put in um, whole pages of, of information. You can't put in sticky notes with with additional information beyond whatever the you know those those notes might be that you would use in the in the day to day um, using of the book. When you get to the exam center, the proctor will flip through the book to make sure that you don't have those additional pages put in and if you do those pages will be removed. Anything else on that? You know, as Cheryl shared her personal perspective, I too brought in my uh, DRG expert in a in a uh, blah, 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 pharmaceutical book. Uh, I never opened my DRG expert, and uh, I looked up one drug name. So it really is about your knowledge base, not so much what you can quickly find in a book and try and put an answer in. And I think sometimes by doing so, your gut reaction is missed, and as a Again, a former professor, I'm going to say your gut reaction is typically correct because it's that thought that's driven completely by your experience without you calculating and trying to manipulate the answer. It, it really is the right answer. And when you spend time investigating into the book to try and validate it, you end up changing your mind and then you end up getting the question wrong. A lot of people do that. You need to go with your gut reaction. You know, this might be a good Someone point. Penny, um, sorry to, to bring this up, but a, a lot of times, too, people might have a little bit of unrealistic expectations about performance on the exam. And what I mean by that is um, the goal shouldn't necessarily be to make 100%. If you're using the study guide and you're going through the questions, you're unlikely to make 100% there either. Because remember, there is variability within CDI. There's variability within coding. Different people have different perceptions. And so um, it's OK if you don't make 100%. Of course, there are some people out there that you know want 100% all the time, want to be perfect all the time. Um, but again, if you have a, a strong understanding of the CDI role, if you're frequently continuing your, your um, performing continuing education, reading things, staying involved in the community, learning about IPPS, making sure you know the updates, keeping abreast of professional standards and practices and things like that, then that should be sufficient to guide you to allow you to pass the exam. Will it help you get 100%? Probably not. But 100% is not necessarily a realistic example because of that variability within the exam. If it were 100%, then it wouldn't be a good indicator of, of performance. So. Any other thoughts on that, Fran? No, I, I agree 100%.
That's a really good point to make, Cheryl. And I and I just have to say that in the couple of years that I've been doing my job managing this program, I have never seen anybody score higher than a 92 on this test. So if anybody ever does get a 100, believe me, we will be calling them out and um, highlighting their uh, their amazing achievement. Someone asks again, what score do you need to pass the test? And the score needed to pass is a 76. Is the exam, is there a time limit? Yes, there is. There is a three hour time limit to begin and finish the exam. You may stand up and take a break and leave the room, uh, get a drink of water, use the restroom if you need to, but any, any of that time does not get credited on to the end. You do only have the three hours to take the test. Uh, I have another question here from another person who's a foreign medical graduate who would like to um, achieve the CCDS certification. But this person asks a very interesting question. Uh, they don't have the two years of experience, but yet they can't seem to get a job as a CDS without the certification. Um, Fran and Cheryl, I'm sure you hear this from folks as well. How best do we uh, encourage someone to continue moving forward in this industry toward getting the time that they do need in order to take the certification exam? Well, I, I as a consultant, um, I do see many, many hospitals still hiring and training their people and not, and, and not that requirement to already be certified. Um, in that instance where it is a requirement, um, it, it's just not going to happen through this route. But um, I do think that um, there are still very many places out there who see this as growth in the role, not a necessity to the role. And what they will find real quickly when they can't find enough people who are certified and willing to move and, and be relocated is they're going to have to open up that window for people without and train and grow those people internally. I mean, it is a very quick growing profession. Uh, you know, we, I, I can quote statistics up and down, and I'm sure Cheryl can as well, related to where programs are and, and, and in that growth. But I think as we continue to grow, that's the ideal candidate, but it's not the only candidate. And I think um, utilizing your knowledge set and those skills um, in some other capacities that would then allow you to get in the door for CDI is appropriate. But um, I, I, I know that there are some places who are looking for that certification but certainly it shouldn't be the driving force for hiring the right people into the role. That's good advice. Cheryl, you probably spoke with a lot of folks during um, boot camps who asked you those kinds of questions. Yeah, and I, I agree with Fran. Um, you know, the other thing that I always caution people too is that the other certification out there, the CDIP, which is by AHIMA, also requires similar um, criteria as the CCDS in order to sit for that certification, as do many of the coding certifications. So it's not uncommon for there to be, you know, years of experience prior to being able to sit for certification. It's great for that organization if they can be that selective um, to have someone that's, that's, that's credentialed when they step into the role. But I think that's not, I don't see that's the norm yet. I think it might be preferred, but I don't think it's required on a majority of job applications. Matter of fact, I think ASHEMA recently did a job analysis study, I'm not sure if that's been published widely or not, um, where they were looking at the requirements for CDIs and what kind of credential is required versus preferred and so forth. Um, and the majority of the time they found that it was a preferred but not required. Um, and you might also be able to, to leverage with the organization, um, here's when I'm qualified to take it, I, I will take it in that time period, you know, can you give me a trial period um, until you get to that, to that time period. I think the other thing too is um, probably membership in ACTUS or AHIM or any type of accredited type organization might be helpful as well because probably the organization is looking for ethical practice. So anything you can do to demonstrate that you are an ethical member of the profession would probably go a long ways to um, just because there are some variability in practice habits. So um, ha having that membership in ACTUS, you have a code of conduct. Having that membership in AHIMA, uh, you have that code of conduct and so forth. So that might also be a help. Good, thank you. Um, and this kind of leads into one more good question, and that is, what is the difference between the ACTUS CCDS certification and AHIMA's CDIP certification? 
Cheryl, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I'll start out first, um, but let me let me give a big disclaimer. Um, I was lucky enough to be on the contributing uh, group who helped to write the initial CDIP. Um, I was reviewed for items on that, so I did not sit for the CDP exam. I was grandfathered into it because of my contributions, because if you work on the exam, obviously you can't then turn around and take it. Um, so I do not have personal experience sitting for the CDIP exam, and it's been several years since I've been involved with it, um, since I was working with ACTUS and involved on the CCDS exam. But routinely what I hear from a lot of people who have both credentials, and I'm sure um, Fran can share her experiences in a minute, is that the CDIP, which is an AHEMA-based exam, works very well for people in a managerial role, especially if they're an HIM manager, director, or so forth, because it's very broad in the type of information that it covers, um, which is very similar to the broadness you might see with the RHIA, RHIT, which are HIM credentials, um, and even the CCS and the CAC, uh, and even the coding exams are somewhat broad in what they cover. It's not just coding focused. Whereas mm, the most of feedback I hear regarding the CCDS, which is the actus based exam, um, the one that we're talking about today, it's more of a staff level, here's what you do in the trenches, here's what you do as a day in the life of a CDI, and kind of supporting someone who does the daily function as a CDI, um, more so than a managerial perspective of CDI. So it really depends on what is your background. I guess the other big distinguisher at this point in time is that the CCDS, uh, the credential offered through ACTUS, um, is affiliated with nursing credentials. And what I mean by that, if your organization is a magnet hospital, um, magnet does recognize the CCDS as a, a, an accreditation for the nurses. And a lot of times the nursing credits that you take will contribute towards maintaining your, um, your ACTUS credential, your CCDS. Whereas AHEMA, sometimes their requirements for continuing education are a little bit different, and they're specific more so to coding. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fran, you want to add to that? No, I, I agree. I think one was designed with a little bit more of the boots on the ground clinical focus with, you know, the interaction with the medical staff, uh, and one was designed a little bit more from the actual code perspective. So getting to the same results but from a different focus initially, I think there's been a lot of change and overlap over the years, but I do think that still that, that base difference is, is where they really come from, from a mindset perspective. Good. Thank you. Uh, another question. If you have your CCDS and you have another certification, can you use, uh, can you combine CEUs or do they have to be exclusive uh, to one certification or another. No, they don't. You are certainly welcome to submit a variety of different CEUs toward your CCDS recertification. We accept uh, CEUs from AHEMA, from AAPC, we accept nursing CEUs, as long as those are CDI-related training and education sessions, and we consider CDI-related to be CDI documentation, um, disease process, anatomy and physiology related, uh, those kinds of topics. More information on that is available on the ACTUS website. And we have someone asking, um, do you advise that we read the new 2015 coding guidelines before we take the exam? I don't know the answer to that one. Fran, can you help? Well, I mean, I think being most current is is always applicable in the role. Um, but you know, looking at um, the coding guidelines themselves, without from an ICD-9 perspective, not the ICD-10 perspective, uh, there has been very little change, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, in how we look at things. So there's not significant difference between 2014 and 2015. That said, looking forward to ICD-10. There are some significant coding guideline changes that would be, if you're taking it after that January new test installment, um, it would probably behoove you to look at that uh, coding update. Okay, good. Thank you. And I have one final question. Um, I have someone who says that she will have her two years of experience in November, and she would like to take the exam in December. When do, when do we recommend that she submit her application? 
you have to have the minimum of the two or three years based on your background before you can apply. So if this person puts their application in in November, it will take two to three weeks to go through our approval cycle and get uh, uh, funneled through finance and customer service. So I'm sure this person will have no problem um, scheduling an exam in December. And with that, we've come to the end of our question and answer session. There are a few more that we didn't get to directly, but uh, the answers for these will be found in um, in the candidate's handbook. And again, you'll be able to listen to this presentation again and see all of these slides um, again up on the website. Now, I'd like to offer Fran and Cheryl each an opportunity to kind of wrap up and, and make any final points that they would like to. Cheryl, would you like to begin? Yeah, I guess the main thing I would like to say is, um, yeah, it's a little intimidating. It's a little scary whenever you have to take a test and, and show your knowledge, um, especially in your career choice. But be patient with yourself. Um, if you've been doing the role and you've got the requirements to apply for the credential, then chances are you're going to do just fine. So do a little bit of prep, do a little bit of homework um, in reviewing concepts that maybe you haven't worked with it in a while. But the main thing is take a deep breath, do your best, and you'll probably be okay. Yeah, I would I would support Cheryl's comments and say that you know the people that I talk to and, and run into as a consultant, majority of them who uh, were successful speak to um, comments like, I, I, I think I overstudied um, the questions I got wrong. If I had to do it again, I know I I I, I changed my answer. You know all those common test taking errors that people experience as as you do this. But I, I think the biggest thing is is just Trust yourself. Trust what you've been doing. Um, when we put the criteria together and the requirements, it was because we know that in this role, you don't really feel comfortable, confident, and proficient until you've been doing it for a couple years. So you need to trust that. You need to trust that what you've been doing is the right way to be, be to approach this, and accept when you look at those questions that what you think you should do is probably what the answer is because we're looking to test what the common uh, CDS response would be, not trick you or try and identify those rare circumstances where something happens differently. It really is about certifying people who are doing, who are performing in this role on a daily basis and giving you that credential to support that you are truly an expert in this business. So if you have to, you have to look at it from that perspective and trust yourself in your ability to perform. Thank you, Fran. Uh, in closing, we want you to know that your feedback is very important to us. Shortly, the person who registered for the program will receive an evaluation link, and we hope that that will be distribute, distributed to everybody from the facility who listens to this program. We'd appreciate it if you would complete the evaluation at your earliest convenience. Within that evaluation email, you will also receive a live link to the address listed on your screen for the CCDS certification webpage, www.hcpro.com slash actus slash certification. On that page, you will find more information about the CCDS, how to download the candidate handbook, as well as a copy of today's slide presentation. Once again, when that's ready, we'll post the on-demand version of the program as well. And we hope that that will be by Friday morning. In closing, I want to thank you, Fran and Cheryl, for joining me today and sharing your knowledge on this important topic. And to all of our listeners, thank you for putting aside your time to be with us today to watch this program. We look forward to providing you with other helpful programs in the future. And personally, I look forward to sending you your CCDS lapel pin. Have a great day.